Business Matters is brought to you in part by Lion Burger Construction and Berglund Center, where live entertainment lives in the Roanoke Valley. Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a program on Blue Ridge PBS that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region because business matters. I'm Gene Morano. Our guest today will discuss a subject that's received some attention lately at the federal level. Kimberly A. Weider is the CEO of Elder Care Solutions based in Roanoke. She's also creator of the Care Colloquium, a major conference on the subject coming later this year. Kim was also recently named by Roanoke Magazine as one of its 40 under 40 young professionals who are making their mark. And Kim, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, first of all, let's talk about what Elder Care Solutions is. This is all about family caregiving uh, and just talk about define that what that is for people sure so family caregivers are people that are either family members or close friends to an elderly loved one that are providing care for them in what's called an unpaid manner so unpaid care so not your professional caregivers but your family caregivers and so there's a distinction between the two now this has always happened forever Absolutely. Like, why is it getting members? more attention now so there's what I'm calling a perfect storm um, that is brewing, that is creating this situation where more family caregivers are becoming responsible for the care of elderly loved ones. So we can talk about the baby boomers, which we're all familiar with what that generation is, and the messaging that's been given to us forever is that this is a huge generation. So we all know that. Um, but what there's some other markers around that, like the baby boomers are the first generation to go through modern health care for their entire lives. So they are experiencing a different aging experience than the generations before them. Right now, baby boomers are living on average 18 years longer than their counterparts in the generation before them. So their late chapter of life is much extended. Um, in addition, baby boomers will have like chronic conditions that they need help with. So they're aging for a much longer time. Their retirement stage is is vastly expanded and they need help but it's not that critical care or skilled nursing level care that they need help with it's with more like chronic conditions lower level cares and that is where family caregivers are having to step in and carry the brunt of caregiving meanwhile they're dealing with their own families and you talk sure. about the the sandwich generation right. where people they're still young enough to have kids at home, Yeah. but they're also dealing with like aging parents. Yeah, so I think our lifespans are looking a little different as well, where you, know, you would go to college, maybe meet someone, you get married, you go into the workforce, you have kids, and you retire, do some bucket list items, and then you maybe take on the care of your elderly loved one later in life. And now what life looks like is you get to the part where you're in the workforce and you have kids, and then your elderly parents need some help, and now you're sandwiched in between um, growing children and aging parents that both need your care. Mm -hmm. um, so talk about Talk about what, how Elder Care Solutions works, your yeah. company. Yeah, so Elder Care Solutions is sitting in a little piece of the pie in what's called the care economy. So any business that has supports or services that support family caregivers is in the care economy. And where we put our focus is helping with the financial strain of elder care. So taking care of an elderly loved one is incredibly expensive. It's very expensive to grow old in the United States. And so a lot of families are in in overwhelming and unsustainable financial situations. Mm -hmm. So how do we pay for it? I mean, you yeah. know, how do we pay for that? And do we need to start preparing earlier in life? Do the people that are aging and are gonna need help from their family, mm -hmm. do they need to start Absolutely. So planning is absolutely the best way to go about aging, but most people don't do that right now. We definitely need a culture shift around that. Um, medical care, is pretty well covered in the United States. So our systems that we all kind of think of, like, well, when I grow old and I need some help with the finances part, Medicare is there, or perhaps I'll have to go on Medicaid, or I'm a veteran and so there's veteran benefits. They don't cover as much of the long-term care 
and that's what elderly people are needing more of now. So there's this like black hole of care that's needed and a lack of funds to cover it. Mm -hmm. So families are putting up their personal funds. And that's what we come in and help with is how to manage that financial strain and give them strategies to do that in a better way. So can you sort of, can you set up an endowment of sorts <laughs> with your, with your whatever assets you do have? Yeah, so it depends um, because you want to make sure that anything that you do is not going to put you at risk for ineligibility for like Medicaid down the line. Right. Um, and so it's a, it's a tricky situation and there's a lot of forethought that needs to go into mm -hmm. it. And we really are trying to help families be empowered with thinking years down the line and starting to have our best guess of what aging is going to look like so that we can make really good decisions so that they kind of have a plan for as care changes and in increases in level. And a lot of people want to age at home. Absolutely. You know. And quite frankly, with the generation that's aging now, that's the only way we're going to age them well. We simply don't have enough room in institutions. So there's right. no, there's not enough rooms, there's not enough beds for people to actually age the baby boomers well. They have to do it at home, which is another reason why family caregivers are having to step in much more. Right. And they're going to, you know, if you age at home, you, you're going to have to look at maybe modifications to home. Absolutely. Like that. Yeah, there's a lot to consider there. Um, so what do you see as your mission when you, when you <laughs> talk to people? <laughs> I'm on a mission with Elder Care Solutions to fight this financial crisis that families are in. I also want to help build an infrastructure for elder care, which is hugely lacking in the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, I know uh, it might have been in Build Back Better, which didn't yeah. pass, but President Biden sure. was talking about funds for elder care. Right. Are you happy to see it being discussed at the federal Absolutely. level? And do you have any idea how that would work? Would, would there be money dispersed to people mm -hmm. or to institutions or what? There were three really important pieces of Build Back Better, and I'm so grateful that the Biden administration at least started the conversation. Um, so one of the considerations was increased tax breaks for family caregivers. So like how uh, parents were getting tax breaks for taking care of children during COVID, it would be the same thing if you also had a dependent that was your elderly parent. Uh, the other part was, um, a, expanding community and home-based care because that's where the majority of care is taking place right now. And so if Medicare could expand and cover some of those aspects of care, that would be a huge benefit to families. And none of it got decided on. <laughs> some right. things got kind of pushed aside, uh, but the conversation was extremely important and it allowed for some new advocacy efforts that made a huge difference. I was wondering if Medicare would be part of the solution. You know, they, the, the, some people like Senator Tim Kaine has talked about Medicare for all to expand, get mm -hmm. more people with health care coverage. But it seems like you have sort of a structure in place with, and you're, you know, you're putting money in the Medicare fund, would that be a good place to start perhaps? What I can say is that Medicare is starting to realize that if the family caregiver is supported well, then the elderly person ages better, which we have known for a long time, but putting money where their mouth is and mm -hmm giving supports under the Medicare umbrella so that they can get more respite care or they can have coverage for support and education. We are starting to see that and there's a growing number of Medicare plans, especially Advantage plans, that are putting out benefits for the caregiver, not just the person that they're carrying the insurance, which is great. Uh, you've been writing a series of articles for Valley Business Front yeah. Magazine uh, that businesses have an opportunity to help tackle mm -hmm. the, the elder care crisis, the family caregiving crisis. How do you see business helping and what's in it for them? Yeah, there's a big conversation in human resources right now. Because COVID was so transparent, like we were on Zoom, we turn our cameras on and you see like the crisis happening behind us. Right? So it shed light on what situations these families are in. And it started a conversation on how we can support employees that are also balancing elder care. We have barely supported employees that have children, right? And then the idea that they also have elderly parents that need support is something that really hasn't been considered before. And now there's a huge conversation about it. So implementing 
safe environments where people can reveal that they are a caregiver because there's a lot of fear around that right now where employees uh, might are, need a couple hours a day to they do worry it's going to impact their career pretty negatively you know if they reveal that they are a caregiver they're worried that the time it's going to take to actually do care is going to impact their job right um, and then also what supports can you put in place through like an employee assistance program or direct employee benefits to support them and if you do that then businesses can really realize like huge productivity gains, they can attract key talent, which is huge right now in the Great Recession, and they can retain their employees. Right, the productivity issue I was gonna bring up, you know, let's say you have an employee, maybe even in their 50s or 60s, mm -hmm. that's a senior employee, a wealth of knowledge, and you wanna keep them around Absolutely. where they don't have to leave early to take care of a parent, that would seem to be one way to kind of justify Absolutely. You know, as an employer spending some money. Mm -hmm. There's some metrics out there that people who are taking care of elderly parents lose a day and a half a week because of the, the balancing act between doing their career and taking care of their parent. And the productivity percentage is like 11% that can be realized, which is really big for businesses. Wow. Um, is this an American problem, by the way, or do other countries yeah. do a better job? <laughs> That's an interesting. So I, I actually didn't know that until about a few months ago. I was invited to do a presentation for a group of people that lived in Turkey. And I had to look up, like, well, how is Europe handling this? Because all we hear in the United States is that, you know, they have better infrastructure and care is so much easier. And that's um, actually a worldwide problem. And one of the issues is that every country has a baby boomer generation. Some of them are at different times. It all depends on when the war settled in that particular country, and then a baby boomer generation was created, right? Uh, and so there is a strain across the world on how we take care of this very big generation that predominantly is living much longer right. and needing different types of care. Uh, what is different though is that in other countries and for this particular demographic, the Turkish people I was speaking to, the familialism is much different than it is in the United States. So there's no question that you will take care of your parent. It's completely expected. There's never uh, am I going to be in this situation? And in fact, you're expected to not leave the household. So there's multi-generational homes happening, which is increasing the strain for people who want to contribute to a career and have a different life than what it looked like 50 years ago. Yeah, a little bit different yeah. than the mm -hmm. American way of thinking. Sure. But if you know early on that that's what's expected, maybe you plan a little bit more or... It's still very difficult though, especially when you can't predict when someone's going to need what level of care. Accidents happen, strokes happen, heart attacks, people break their hips. You know, these are usually emergencies and they're spontaneous and they're crises. Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea that, you know, in addition to people having children a little bit later in life, and so we're getting these huge sandwich generations all over the United, all over the United States and the world. And the sandwich people, those are the people that still have the younger kids at home sure. that are dealing with yeah, Asian predominantly Europe. that is Gen X generations, but millennials are coming in and taking over. I always remind people, we we say millennial, and we have to like, I'm a millennial, we're 40 now. Like, we <laughs> <laughs> we're adults, and so millennials and Gen X predominantly make up the sandwich generation where we have children that are not finished with the rearing, and then we have adult parents that are like, we need you to step in and help out, and All you're right. just like caught between these two generations that are pulling your resources. Congratulations on your 40, uh, Thank you. under 40, made it under the wire there. It was <laughs> close. It was around like 39 and three quarters. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you made it though. Um, yeah, uh, I want to talk about uh, a recent study. Uh, some of the numbers, the CD, a study by the CDC, mm -hmm. the Census Bureau, uh, World, Health, World Health Organization, and yeah. Genworth. The cost of, of care study found that pocket cost for family caregivers, caregivers averages 26% of household income, more than $31,000 annually, in Virginia, and that's the 17th lowest cost in the country. Yeah, so I mean, how do you pay for this? And Virginia is not high when it comes to elder care, but it's still extremely high. You know, um, clients that come my way for elder care solutions, it seems to be a pretty magic number that they're spending in between a thousand and two thousand dollars a week. A week on care, and that's home-based care. So trying to get someone to come into the home and take care of their elderly parent that just can't be there independently seven days a week or five days a week, right? Um, Where are they getting the money? <laughs> it's the average person. Surprising. Yeah, what they're doing is spending down their assets. You know, so the the first short-term savings deplete, 
and then they start tapping into their long-term savings like retirement accounts or IRAs and then when they start to realize you know mom and dad's money is gone my money is gone this is unsustainable what are we going to do there's a, a stressful crisis that happens and they start looking out for help it's so much better if you can plan for it and not get to the crisis point but that's what's happening right now the way we want to shift that is start looking at what is around you in more strategic ways so what assets can you leverage like home wealth or those accounts doing them in smarter ways taking the money out in smarter ways leveraging life insurance plans rearranging your insurance policy so some people carry supplemental insurance on top of medicare which makes sense but they forget to look at the redundancies that exist so they're really overpaying for a lot of insurance and so like making sure you get the cost right and you have all the support that you need based on what care looks like for mm. you right now so there's a lot of out of the box thinking but there's no way to know that if you don't have a guide right yeah is are there elder care insurance policies i mean are there policies that you can take out even to cover yourself when you get to that age where someone's going to have to help you so that you don't put so much of a burden on your family and is there anything like that so you know I, I know i've heard of long-term insurance but yeah is there something that is geared towards you know, taking care That's of the insurance. predominant policy is long-term care insurance. And so it's setting, paying into an insurance policy that's setting money aside. So if you should need it and pull on it, you get X amount of dollars a month towards care or X amount of dollars a year towards care. What we are seeing is organizations like Mutual of Omaha, New York Life, uh, starting to do hybrid policies. So they mix a long-term care insurance policy with a life insurance policy. And those can be very interesting and innovative, but the reason we're seeing creativity is because families are not making it. Like there's too much struggle, so we need innovative products. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one of my jobs is to keep up with those types of products so we can tell clients about them. Where are you finding this information out? To scouring the web? Networks. Or? Really? Networking? Yeah, absolutely. You're big so on networking. I'm big on networking, but right, the right kind of networking. So knowing what we call like key players in different fields. So one of the reasons I got into Elder Care Solutions was my background in interdisciplinary teamwork. So the idea that it takes multiple siloed professionals to come together and piece together a puzzle for the best outcome. And so that's how I approach Elder Care Solutions work. I don't need to be the expert in all things life insurance, health insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, but I should have pieces of that on my team so that I can tap in and say, hey, I have a client who has this policy and this one, does that make sense together? And their expertise can really help the client. Yeah, you know, working in silos is a problem in a lot of, sure. a lot of industries. And you, I wanted to kind of mention this to us personally. You were, uh, you were on a healthcare track. You were teaching. Uh, inter interprofessionalism was your thing, and, and you know, I know you got into this. But how, what really spurred you to kind of make a career change at this mm. point, become a CEO of a company before you were? Yeah. 40? So yeah, oh, this is my third career. I found <laughs> I started off as a scientist, and I would spend my day at a microscope in a clinical lab um, diagnosing pathologies, which I absolutely adored had a huge passion for the science and the theory, which led me into higher education. I started teaching that for students, so started teaching like hematology and clinical chemistry, and um, also really, really loved that, and spent over 11 years in higher ed, and rose to some administrative positions, and that's where I was doing scholarly work on like interprofessional and interdisciplinary teams. And I was at a conference, actually, national conference, presenting on the interdisciplinary work. And a gentleman approached me after the presentation and gave me a card and asked if he could call and ask me some questions. And he was one of the co-founders of Elder Care Solutions. And so for about a year, I would consult with them and share my expertise on interdisciplinary work. And from them, started learning this family caregiver crisis and what long-term care looked like and these horrible situations that families were getting in, and we were fine-tuning this idea of the best way to help them with the financial strain. And they then invited me to come in and run the company as a CEO, uh, which was absolutely terrifying to leave something very secure and safe, like higher ed, to go do business, which you my messaging always at least had been like, that's a very scary and up and down kind of world. Um, 
But at the same time, I went through a personal caregiving story. And so and that... Not with somebody who was elderly. Not with someone who was elderly, but an adult. And I experienced firsthand a spontaneous schedule that could blow up every day, emergencies that would land in my lap that needed my attention right away, uh, needing to be the sole responsibility for res like transportation to appointments and being the keeper of this big health story because I was the one who was at all the places and coordinating between the health professionals and I just totally got bought in like oh this is really difficult and this is such a strain and it's emotional and it's financial and it's mental and I just thought I absolutely want to be a part of this solution and so much so that the, at the end of last year, um, I became the full owner of Elder Care Solutions and my co-founders are now on my advisory board. And so it's a beautiful arrangement and I am on a mission to make some huge impacts. Good for you. And we should, I, I guess we should mention that, although most of the time it is elderly people, it does not have to be. It can be a contemporary where you, that you're giving the caregiving yeah, I would say 99% of my clients are actually the family caregivers. They are the ones that come my way, and it is typically a story of I'm taking care of my parent or an in-law, and I need help because I'm making the decisions. I'm managing the finances. I've spent my own personal funds on care that we have not been able to figure out how to pay for. Right. Uh, it rarely is it the senior themselves that come my way. I'm wondering, uh, and of course, some people in Washington are not going to like this because maybe it smacks of socialism, but do you think there might come a point where the same way the government takes FICA out of your check for Social Security, mm -hmm. that they might say, look, <laughs> we need to take care of this. You're gonna, we're going to take another 2% out of your check to put away for your care. Sure. Care. That would be a very long conversation, and I think we'd see many administrations before something like that got done. But at least we're talking about expansions of these, the infrastructures that do exist, which is great. Hmm. Uh, let's talk about the few minutes of the the CARE Colloquium coming mm -hmm. up in, in November at Hotel Roanoke. This is a major national conference, and, and how'd you pull this together? I know you're on the, is it the AGA? Uh, ASA. ASA, which is the? American Society on Aging. Okay, which is, I guess helps you network. But talk about the CARE collo Colloquium coming up in mm -hmm. November, and who's coming and, and what the goal is. Yeah, so, and this is actually coming from the networks that I just built doing elder care solutions. So it's so important for me to know who's out there, who's in the care economy, where they sit, the work that they're doing, so that when clients come my way, I can piece together this full picture of support that they need. And I kept coming across amazing, incredible, innovative services and products. And as I would meet other people, they wouldn't know about other people I met. And I recognized that there was not a space for the leaders to come together, for the CEOs and the founders and the COOs and the executive directors to have a space to come together and just say, like, what do you do? And tell me about it. And how can we maybe work together so that we're providing more holistic support to our clients? And also some thought leadership, like we are the practitioners on the ground trying to create the best solutions possible. So we're the right people to be talking about what I've identified as like the big care issues, like supporting caregivers who are in the workforce or DEI issues in caregiving. Care is not equitable. It hits different, different societies in different ways, different, different communities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so we need to talk about how we can best support these diverse communities with the work that we do because one size fits all is not the way to go. And I think you said you have like 300 participants at this point? So 300 uh, plus is our goal. Predominantly everyone right now is coming from out of Roanoke, but we of course want Roanoke participants to come. Right. I feel so privileged that I live in Roanoke, Virginia, which is a city I absolutely love, but also for our size, we are so incredibly resourced. So the fact that I had the idea to host a national conference and not think twice that it could happen in my hometown feels really incredible. And the fact that so many people jumped on it, Kim, I mean, I guess it's got to say that these people realize we need to do something like space. this. And that's the feedback I keep getting when I share. They're like, oh, this is so needed. And so that feels really great. And I can't wait to have all these people in the same space and feel the energy that it's going to create. 
Would you like to see some action items come out of this? Would you like to, you know, not just people getting together and talk about it, but what would you like to come out of this? Yeah, folklore? no, so um, we have been really creative and innovative with this. And so some action items that we already have in place is we've partnered with Wondrous Brooks in Salem, Virginia. They're gonna do what's called a book nook at the conference because so many of these leaders that are coming are authors. They've written books about caregiving challenges. And so we want to share these titles with the other leaders uh, as people want to build their organizational libraries and say like give me 10 copies of that and drop ship it to my home base and when I get back it's there and I can run a book club like a nonprofit will have a book club for family caregivers or we'll do an educational series and everyone gets a copy um, and so it's going to be like a bookstore slash reading nook which is going to be super cool and really draw a lot of attention to these great pieces of literature that need to be mm -hmm. circulated we also have partnered with a national podcast called will gather um, nicole will who runs that interviews business leaders and organizations that have services and products that support family caregivers so strong alignment with the care colloquium mm -hmm. and she's going to book interviews with the leaders to be on her podcast and we have a strong phila philanthropy um, aspect to this so we're doing a speed giving event in the secret speakeasy at Hotel Roanoke where the leaders will get together and, and we have a goal for in 20 minutes can we raise ten thousand dollars wow. for a nonprofit that supports family caregivers. We're going to have to leave it there. It's too bad you're not passionate about this. I know, right? <laughs> Tim Weider from Elder Care Solutions, thanks for joining us. Thank today. you so much. I'm Gene Moreno. This is Business Matters. Thanks for joining us.